1986, a Singapore hotel collapsed like a pack of cards, burying guests in under a minute. Why did the building suddenly give way? You're seconds from disaster. Singapore. Famed throughout Asia for its order and calm efficiency. Then, suddenly, one Saturday morning, disaster stops the entire country in its tracks. A six-story hotel crashes to the ground in under 60 seconds. 33 people die and 17 more are buried alive, trapped beneath thousands of tons of steel, glass and concrete. It's the worst collapse in the country's history and it leaves investigators baffled. Now, using advanced computer simulations, we reveal exactly what caused the tragedy. Disasters don't just happen, they're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Asia, Singapore. Over four million people live crammed in a country the size of New York City. It's a dynamic, vibrant place that attracts people from all over the region and beyond, striving to make a better life for themselves in this English-speaking island of opportunity. Downtown, tower blocks soar into the sky as architects struggle to maximize the limited space. Much of it, land reclaimed from swamp and sea. Even below ground, the city is teeming with activity as Singapore expands at breathtaking pace. Giant tunnels are bored by teams of engineers from all over the world, working on a new subway system that will connect the high-rise area with older and less prosperous districts like this one, Little India. Six kilometers from downtown, this area is home to the manual laborers who support the booming economy. Here on Owen Road stands the Hotel New World, built in 1971. The building is unremarkable. 36 reinforced concrete columns supporting six concrete floors. There's a car park in the basement. The local branch of a bank takes up the ground floor. Above that is a popular nightclub. And a budget hotel occupies the rest of the building. As is usual in this hot climate, air conditioning units and water tanks are installed on the roof. At over 24 meters, it's small by Singapore standards, but one of the tallest buildings in Little India. The building has led an untroubled life, apart from one serious incident. In 1975, when a gas leak poisoned 35 people. Everybody made a full recovery. And the building was given a clean bill of health. March 14th, 1986, 11 years later. It's a Friday night, and as usual, Madame Lily Teo, the nightclub hostess, sets up the first floor bar in preparation for a busy evening, expecting the usual mix of businessmen and couples who visit her club. She's startled to see that a column on the dance floor has cracked. The time is 7 p.m. She decides to inform the building's owner. Shortly afterwards, with the nightclub now open, a couple of workmen start repairing the damage. No one pays much attention to them. By 9.15 p.m., the club is in full swing. In the staff dressing room, one of the girls checks her makeup. In Singapore, like most countries around the world, a broken mirror is a symbol of bad luck. 
But it's the end of the working week, and everyone in the nightclub is too busy having a good time to worry about silly superstitions. The next morning. Saturday, March 15th. 8 a.m. Xiong Cheng Guan, assistant manager of the ground floor bank, walks through the park with his childhood sweetheart. They were married three months ago, but he's been working so hard they haven't had time for their honeymoon yet. We are happily married and we actually planned a trip to Australia and New Zealand. As Jong leaves for work, he says goodbye to his wife, Leong CC, knowing it's a big day for her. She's taking an important exam. I was having my final exam for a diploma. Jong and I had planned to meet in the afternoon. As it's a Saturday, the bank will close at lunchtime, and the couple are planning on spending the rest of the day walking hand in hand through Singapore's busy streets. I was looking forward to Saturday afternoon, after work, and then uh, usually we will go out. 17 people work in the bank. It's a close, friendly team. As is common in Singapore, they take great pride in providing their customers with efficient service. 21-year-old Christina Fuhr has been working at the bank for just three months. This is my first job in the bank and I enjoy it very much. Christina has never been up to the nightclub on the floor above, but she's sitting almost directly below the column on the dance floor that cracked the night before. Ten ten a.m. A customer comes into the bank. She's out of breath, saying there's a problem in the basement car park. Debris is falling down. The customer told us that the bank is going to collapse. Jiang stays in the bank whilst Christina and a colleague rush down to the basement to investigate. Although none of the cars are damaged, as they're leaving, they see two men in overalls working by a cracked column. There's debris on the floor. But the workmen say everything is fine. Reassured that it's nothing serious, they go back to work in the ground floor bank. Two floors above, in the hotel reception, staff see cracks and fissures spreading across the wall. But down below, Xiong and Christina are unaware of any further problems. Throughout the building, vital supporting walls and pillars are starting to fracture. The Hotel New World is on the brink of collapse. Something extraordinary is happening within an unremarkable building in Singapore's Little India. Cracks are spreading throughout the walls and supporting columns. But in the bank on the ground floor, assistant manager Cheong is oblivious. He's wondering how his wife Cece has done in her exam. I wanted to see how she fared during the exam. It's 11.22 a.m. Further back, Christina is finishing off the week's work when she's startled by a sound. It's falling debris. I actually did not know what's happening. And now she starts to feel vibrations all around her. We can feel the floor is shaking. 11.26 a.m. Now the whole building is starting to shake uncontrollably. Pillars are cracking. Walls are giving way. An unstoppable, catastrophic collapse is set in motion. It was very sudden. One instant you are working, the next instant it is all pitched dark in. Thousands of tons of steel reinforced concrete rain down on the people inside.
in one terrifying minute, the Hotel New World suffers total structural failure. Trapping dozens of people. What was once a local landmark and a place of work is now just a huge mound of rubble, surrounded by an enormous cloud of dust, visible for kilometers around. All six stories of the building have been destroyed, transformed into a concrete tomb. Christina, Chong, and other bank staff are buried at the very bottom of the building rubble, in the pitch black basement car park. We couldn't see anything, we couldn't hear anything. We couldn't even see the, our hand. Zhang can't see his colleague Christina, even though she's just a meter or two away, pinned down by massive concrete slabs. I was just like laying in the coffin. I couldn't move at all. Back on the surface, it's a scene of total devastation. News crews film local people frantically clambering onto the wreckage. They furiously manhandle rubble, desperately searching for any survivors. Eleven thirty-five a.m. Within eight minutes, emergency workers start arriving. Singapore's top military medic, Dr. Lim Meng Kin, rushes to help. He's stunned by the scale of this unprecedented catastrophe. This is the biggest disaster since uh, World War II. The terrible news is spreading to grief-stricken relatives who mingle amongst the crowds of stunned onlookers. It's a scene of total bewilderment and rising dread. Around noon, over half an hour into the disaster, Xiong's wife, Cici, arrives and realizes that her husband is buried somewhere inside the mountain of rubble. She has no way of knowing whether he's dead or alive. She finds her uncle, who happens to be a structural engineer, but he can offer her no real comfort. I remember asking him, what are the chances of Xiong surviving in such a collapse? He told me, we should just hope for the best. About 10 meters from CC, below the rubble, her husband Chong is fighting off the panic. But all around, other survivors, like his colleague Christina, are aware of mounting hysteria. I can hear a lot of people crying. They were uh, asking for help. Some of them were screaming, and some of them were crying in pain. Some of the survivors are badly injured. But assistant manager Chiang is determined to keep everyone calm. I thought it's a matter of time, people will come to rescue us. You see? Twelve thirty p.m. About one hour after the collapse, back on the surface, there's good news. The rescue teams find a survivor, a tourist, who is staying on the top floors of the hotel. Shortly afterwards, they haul a second survivor, a local shopkeeper, from the hotel debris. The rescuers hastily put together a list of all those known to have been in the building when it collapsed. They can account for everyone known to have been in the hotel on the top four floors. 17 are dead, and 11 have been rescued alive. The nightclub on the floor below was empty. But the ground floor bank is a different matter. Their list reveals that up to 20 people, including Chong and Christina, were working there when the building collapsed and will be buried at the very bottom of the rubble. Eleven thirty p.m. Twelve hours after the disaster, the rescue teams are working through the night trying to reach the bank. 
Heavy machinery hauls huge slabs of debris away from the top. But the rubble is very unstable and shifts dangerously. Some 10 meters below the glare of the rescuers' arc lights, with vibrations shaking the wreckage, the horror is growing. The survivors are trapped in a dark tomb under 6,000 tons of concrete and steel. Assistant manager Chiang is just within reach of one of his bank colleagues, who's lying injured nearby, crushed by a beam. He tries desperately to push the beam away, but it's too heavy. I felt very helpless. You know? Your colleagues here dying, and then you can't do anything at all. That was... Uh... That was bad. Xiong realizes his efforts are in vain. I could smell the stench of death. It's, it's very sad. Your own colleague you've been working for so many years with, and all of a sudden he's gone. The crushed masonry is preventing the circulation of air. Oxygen is beginning to run out. Just a meter or two from Jiang, Christina is becoming desperate. I was uh, thinking I'm still very young. I, I still got lots of things to do. And I'm not married yet. I, I can't just die like that. Back on the surface, the rescuers still have 10 meters of rubble to dig through. At this rate, it'll take days to reach Jiang and Christina. With the oxygen getting thinner, this is time they just don't have. <laughs> Midnight. Half a day has passed since the collapse of Singapore's Hotel New World building. Only 11 people have been pulled alive from the rubble. Christina and Chong are trapped deep in the basement car park. A team of Irish engineers working on the nearby subway construction is watching the rescue work. Subway tunneler Tommy Gallagher is especially concerned that the use of heavy machinery may be causing the rubble to shift and fall, potentially endangering the lives of any survivors buried at the very bottom of the mound. We kept saying to the uh, senior people in charge, uh, we think there is people in that building alive. And what you're doing here, you're going to kill them. They propose a radical alternative, abandoning the use of cranes to clear the rubble from the top and instead tunneling deep into the foundations of the building to get survivors out. It's a very difficult decision, but around dawn the authorities give the green light to Tommy and his colleagues. The Irish engineers have no idea exactly where in the basement any survivors may be. After close examination of the building plans, they decide the quickest way to get into the car park is to break through ventilation shafts accessible from street level. A rescue camera reveals a scene of devastation. The tunnelers have to wade through knee-deep water and push past crushed cars. To their horror, they can smell petrol. They know a single spark could set up a devastating explosion the car park is a death trap. That's what we were worried about. Any spark of a machine ring would... The subway engineers have an agonizing wait whilst the water and petrol are pumped out. Then they start hacking a makeshift tunnel through the debris, using small hydraulic jacks to support the thousands of tons of rubble above. Sunday, 7 p.m. It takes seven hours to tunnel nine meters. The, the ground's so unstable above us, everything's, we, we're just taking a chance, like. Then their worst fears are realized. It, it, it started, started to, to close on us. The tunnel caves in. 
Tommy and his mates scramble out moments before the roof collapses. Their path is totally blocked. Sunday, 7.30 p.m. Jean and Christina have been buried in the stifling, claustrophobic darkness for 32 hours. They have no idea rescuers are trying to reach them. Undeterred by the cave-in, the Irish engineers start digging more tunnels in the dangerous building rubble, willingly risking their lives. The tunnelers were the bravest people I've ever met in my life. And the way they went about it, the spirit, it's a spirit that's very rare, really. Tunnels two and three are built from the southeast, but the subway engineers soon find their path blocked by huge slabs of debris. With tunnel one still too dangerous after the cave-in, a fourth tunnel is dug northwards. It takes all night, but Tommy and his mates crawl under crushed cars and dig all the way around the exterior basement wall. We walked round the clock. We never went to bed. Monday, 7 a.m. Chiang and Christina have been trapped in the rubble for almost two days. They're losing track of time. We don't even know how many days we was trapped inside. I was just trying to, 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 to keep alive because I have a lot of things to live for. Then, Chiang hears a noise. We could hear rumbling sounds, you know, from the distance. Hoping that it's a rescue team, the bankers start tapping frantically on the beams that are trapping them. Hello? I'm here. Down here. Where? Down here. I'm coming to get you. We were uh, very happy, didn't know where we are. The tunnelers crawl ever closer to Chiang and Christina. They feel they're on the verge of reaching them, but they face one last obstacle. And all of a sudden we had a meter square concrete beam and it was right in front of us, we had it smack on. So they were on the other side of that. They have no idea where in the building the beam came from but they're desperately concerned that it's helping to support the weight of the collapsed building above them. 6,000 tons of rubble are balanced delicately above the heads of Christina, Chong, and now the tunnelers. It's noon on Monday, two days into the disaster. The rescue workers decide they have no choice except to break through the huge concrete beam. Dr. Lim joins them, ready for any emergency. You don't think of the danger. There's somebody at the end of the tunnel and you want to reach that person. The tunnelers' drills carve through the concrete surprisingly fast. A few meters away, in the darkness, Chong hears the drilling getting louder. They keep asking me, can you see a light? Can you see a light? You know? Finally, I could see there's a chink of light from uh, somewhere. Soon, Chiang is able to see the rescuers just the other side of the hole. The tunnelers are terrified that they may have cut through a major supporting beam. They fear the rubble could come crashing down at any moment. They tell Chiang to stay where he is whilst they prop up the roof. I said, no, thank you. I'm coming out. Chiang cannot bear to stay another moment in the darkness. He scrambles towards safety. He just ran. <laughs> I said, I don't blame you either, because he thought he would never come out of there alive, he said. After two days buried alive, Chiang is able to walk out into the daylight with just a few scratches. That was really a miracle. Christina is buried deeper in the rubble. It takes another seven hours to rescue her. Dr. Lim leads Christina away on a stretcher. Later examinations reveal her only injury is a black eye. I feel just like a hero or something like that. 
Chiong and his wife Cece are finally reunited at the hospital. It was such a moment of joy, such great joy. You just feel that life is very fragile. Any time it can be taken away from you, and uh, you just just live, live. Thanks to the pioneering use of tunnels to dig into the very deepest parts of the rubble, six more survivors are ultimately pulled alive from the wreck of Hotel New World. In all, 17 people have been saved. But 33 have lost their lives. Now, by rewinding the events of that fateful day, and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what really happened to the Hotel New World. Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. A commission of inquiry will be appointed to seek answers to the many questions raised in this, the worst building disaster in Singapore. The investigation team includes Terry Hume, a structural engineer based in Singapore. He has decades of experience in major building construction. Hume visits the site within hours of the collapse and is shocked by what he sees. The first impression was that the whole collapse must have been very rapid and the whole building must have collapsed at the same time. It was clearly something unusual. In a city like Singapore, it's everyone's worst nightmare. Similar buildings are everywhere, and much taller structures soar skywards all across the island. The investigators need to find out why the Hotel New World collapsed, and fast. How did a six-story reinforced concrete building collapse in fewer than 60 seconds? Until the investigators find out, the lives of millions who live and work in similar structures throughout Singapore could be at risk. The team interviews locals who remember that 10 years earlier, a gas leak knocked out 35 people at the hotel site. Could gas have escaped again, causing an explosion? Or worse, could there have been a bomb? It's investigator Terry Hume's first hunch. He knows that explosions leave telltale signs, what the experts call a distinctive signature. The immediate effect of the explosion is normally to certainly blow out the windows, and possibly blow out the side wall. You would see some sort of evidence of this explosion blowing the debris out or window shattered. But the unique marks of an explosion, shattered glass and crushed rubble, blown hundreds of meters from the disaster site, simply do not exist. There was nothing like that. So, if it wasn't an explosion, what could have caused the collapse? It really is quite difficult to demolish a complete building very neatly. The team needs to investigate the disturbing possibility that the building materials were defective. This is the wall here. They interview the Irish tunnelers and learn that some of the concrete was so soft their drills went through it like butter. Could it be that the concrete was badly mixed in the first place, undermining the strength of the building? With millions of lives depending on similar materials throughout the city, it's an horrific thought. The team takes 240 concrete core samples to one of Singapore's top laboratories. Of these, 80 are quickly dismissed as being unusable, unsuitable for testing. The scientists examine the remaining 160 cores to see whether the correct ratio of sand, stones and cement was used. Then they perform concrete strength tests on them. The cores do fracture, but only under very heavy loads. The materials they test meet internationally accepted safety standards. It was a disappointment because that was the easy solution. If the concrete had been poor quality, you'd have immediately had an answer to why it collapsed. Hume concludes the reason the concrete seemed soft was because it was fractured during the violence of the collapse itself. 
So, if it isn't defective building materials, what else could have caused the disaster? The investigators turn to another terrifying scenario, one that, like the concrete, could have implications for the entire city. They look at the land on which the hotel was built and discover, like much of Singapore, it used to be a swampy floodplain drained from the 19th century onwards. This was fine for the construction of small buildings, but like much of the booming city, the Hotel New World was significantly taller, bigger than anything built a hundred years ago. If the reclaimed ground was unstable, could the collapse be just the beginning of an island-wide disaster? The first step is for the investigators to examine the surviving basement walls. If the foundations had moved in the unstable ground, these should show evidence of catastrophic cracks. Intriguingly, they find nothing. To make sure, they analyze the composition of the soil. The team drilled deep into the ground to take samples. Leaving nothing to chance, they also test the strength of parts of the foundations that survived. Finally, after weeks of work, the results come through. Although there was evidence of some small ground movements, the team is forced to conclude that it was not enough to have brought down the building. It became clear that there hadn't been a failure in the foundations. They were quite reasonably well constructed. With yet another avenue closed, the team turned their gaze even further underground. Could the construction of Singapore's new subway have weakened the building's foundations and caused it to collapse? When you build an underground railway in any town, anything that goes wrong is immediately laid to the blame of the underground railway. Could the subway tunnelers be responsible for the disaster itself? Was a bit of a kick in the teeth to it, really, yeah. The investigators quickly establish that the closure of two nearby subway tunnels is less than a kilometre away. What effect could this have had on the building? Subway tunnels have collapsed before. Just a year earlier in South Korea, this building fell into one. It only happened because the building was almost directly above the tunnel. But could there be an unknown mechanism by which the subway was responsible? The Singapore investigators measure the diameter of the tunnel and calculate the ground movements that vibrations would have caused. Even taking this into account, it seems an unlikely solution. Professor Jonathan Wood is a world expert who studied the dynamics of building collapses for over 20 years. If you are within two diameters of the tunnel, you can expect quite an effect. Here they were hundreds of yards away. The team concludes that the subway tunnels were simply not close enough to have been responsible for the collapse. Tommy and the tunnelers are in the clear. We knew it was something that happened, a freak accident, and that's exactly what it was. It's now clear that the collapse of the Hotel New World has not been caused by an explosion, by shoddy construction, by swampland, or by subway tunneling. But buildings don't just collapse. It's like a murder investigation. You must find who is responsible. The investigators know they must be missing a vital piece of evidence. It soon arrives from a very unlikely source. The nightclub. The police interview the women who were working in the first floor club the night before the collapse. The nightclub hostess tells them how, as she was setting up the bar, a pillar on the dance floor cracked. 
The investigators consult the building plans, which show this is column 26 out of a total of 36. They know that a failure of one supporting pillar should not have brought the entire building crashing down. Then they interview one of the girls who was working in the nightclub. She tells them how she was checking her makeup in the dressing room. When the mirror shattered. The mirror was attached to another support pillar, column 32. The investigators now know that a second pillar was close to failure. Next, the team interviews survivor Christina Fuhr. She tells them how, on the morning of the disaster, she went down to the basement car park and saw workmen propping wood against a column. The pillar had cracked and there was plaster on the floor. They identify this as column 30 and it was also failing. It's a crucial breakthrough. There are now eyewitness accounts that three columns were failing in the hours leading up to the disaster. For the first time, the investigators know that three vital supporting columns were stressed right to the limit. There had to be something very badly wrong with the building, but what could it be? As a last resort, the team starts looking at cutting-edge laboratory research into a little-known phenomenon that could provide the answer. When concrete is stressed to near breaking point, tiny cracks can start spreading deep within the heart of the material. Not only are these micro-cracks, as they're called, potentially deadly, but frighteningly, they're invisible to the naked eye. You can only see them under a microscope. It's impossible to know for sure whether the crucial supporting columns of the Hotel New World were suffering from this dangerous disease. But if micro cracks are ignored, they eventually cause the surface of pillars to fracture, greatly reducing the amount of weight they can support. At this point, the building would be on the verge of collapse. If the team is correct, like woodworm eating away timber from within, micro-cracking would have weakened the concrete columns in the building until they were effectively rotten. But where could the extra weight that causes micro-cracking have come from? As the site is being cleared, the investigators see massively heavy objects being pulled from the rubble. They examine the blueprints to see whether these were allowed for in the original plans and make a startling discovery. During the 15 years of its lifespan, the building owner added extra loads to the Hotel New World that were not part of the original design. The team learns that in 1975, the bank built a steel-reinforced strongroom weighing 22 tons on the ground floor. Then in 1978, the building owner installed two air conditioning towers, adding extra weight. In 1982, to improve the building's lackluster appearance, workmen fixed heavy-duty ceramic glazed tiles to the exterior walls. The weight? Over 50 tons. Finally, in 1986, before the collapse, the building owner installed yet another air conditioning tower on the roof to make conditions in the sweltering Singapore heat more comfortable. The investigators believe all this extra weight must have been too much to bear. All modern buildings are designed to support what the experts call the dead load and the live load. The dead load is the weight of the building itself. But for the investigators, the crucial calculation is the live load, the extra weight consisting of people and objects ranging from air conditioning towers to furniture, which a building has to support. 
Could the building support over 100 tons of extra live load placed upon it? The answer is a big surprise. The calculation showed that the live load was adequately supported. Set against the 6,000 ton weight of the building itself, the live load, including over 100 tons of strongroom, tiles and air conditioning units, was insignificant. It should not have caused the building's 36 pillars to give way. The team is back at square one. After months of painstaking work, they still don't know what happened. The team is certain they must have missed some vital clue that will enable them to understand why Singapore's Hotel New World collapsed. They return to the blueprints and pore over photos of the damaged columns again and again. Clutching at straws, they double-check the calculations made by the draftsman for the weight of the building itself, the dead load. What they find is a revelation, a fatal mistake, that means for the entire 15 years after its construction, the building was on the verge of catastrophe. The amazing thing was, basically, this draft was allowed for the live load, and he'd forgotten the dead load. It's an astonishing discovery, a schoolboy mistake. The calculations made by the draftsman were so badly wrong that key columns, such as 26 and 32, could not even support the weight of the building itself. Even without all the extra live load, the air conditioning units, heavy duty glazed tiles and bank strongroom, for 15 years, many of the pillars that were supporting the building had been right at the limit of their strength. The collapse was just a matter of time. All the columns were very near failure and been sitting close to the edge for 15 years. The investigators finally understand why the disaster happened. Now, by rewinding the events leading up to that fateful day, and by following the process of the extensive investigation, we can finally reveal what really happened to the Hotel New World. Friday, March 14th, 1986. For 15 years, hidden from human eyes, deadly micro cracks were spreading deep within the concrete columns of the Hotel New World. 7 p.m. 16 hours before the collapse. Column 26 cracks in the nightclub. It's weakening and starts to pass its load to surrounding pillars. About 13 hours before disaster. Column 32 can't support the extra load and starts to fracture. This causes a mirror attached to it to smash. Just over one hour from disaster, load from the two nightclub columns is being transferred to column 30. It starts cracking, this time in the basement car park. Four minutes before disaster, above Christina, column 26 starts to collapse, causing debris to billow down and vibrations to spread throughout the bank. As three columns collapse, the building reaches the point of no return. An unstoppable chain reaction is set in motion. If you've got your pack of cards, and you, you, all you've got to do is one, knock one card out, and all the other cards follow suit. The entire building crashes to the ground in under 60 seconds, killing 33 people. Tragically, the investigators now know there were plenty of warnings that the hotel was about to collapse. If the building owner had told the authorities that three columns were cracking, instead of ordering workmen to patch them up, disaster could easily have been averted. 
I would believe any structural engineer would have immediately said that you needed to evacuate the building. 33 lives could have been saved. Survivors John and Christina will always remember their colleagues who died in the Hotel New World collapse. I do miss all my colleagues. They are the best that I ever had. But they will also never forget the courage of the subway tunnelers. He was a volunteering and they had to dig through debris which might just fall on them at any time. Without them, I will not be here. So I would like to thank them very much on this. Tommy Gallagher and the subway tunnelers were awarded one of Singapore's highest peacetime honours, the Conspicuous Gallantry Medal. Lessons have been learnt from the tragedy. Singapore completely overhauled its building regulations to ensure that all dead and live load calculations made by architects would in future be independently checked, a crucial extra safeguard that has been adopted by many other countries. Like many cities, Singapore continues to build ever upwards. Mercifully, building collapses are a rare event both in Singapore and throughout the world. But when they happen, the courage and dignity of ordinary people shine through. <laughs>